Welcome everyone to the um, Finance, Resources and Corporate Committee. And have we any apologies, Ben? Um, yes, we've received apologies from uh, Councillor Jeffrey and Mandy Richard. Lovely, thank you so much. And if I may just take this moment to introduce uh, Jocelyn Manners Armstrong, our new independent member, who is a very experienced non-executive director in public and private. And she is here to provide constructive challenge to our committee. So you are very welcome. It's your first committee, so um, I'm hoping that uh, it's, it's, it's clear. And any questions, obviously, uh, please do raise them with our colleagues. Super. So moving on, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest, interest they wish to declare on any item? No, thank you. And exclusion of press and public. There is no need for exclusions. Minutes of the meeting held last November. It seems like another world, doesn't it, November? Um, and uh, are there any comments or questions? Are we happy to confirm they are accurate? Yes, thank you so much. So moving on to the meat of the meeting, the finance update. This is the standard paper that comes to the committee to update us on the financial position at each quarter end. And the paper considers the position at the end of quarter two on revenue and capital spend. So Angela, um, I'd like, to, if you would, to explain the position in more detail. Angela. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you said, this is the quarter two position. The timing of the quarters and these meetings means we're just slightly misaligned. You will get quarter <coughs> three update in the March meeting of this committee. Um, so you have quarter two figures. At taking the revenue first, um, the, the position is showing a number of variances, but they are primarily timing differences. Um, so they, they should all write themselves by the end of the year. So we are at this stage um, saying that there's no information coming through from quarter two spend or, or an income that suggests there are any unexpected um, pressures in the, in the budget at that point. Obviously, since the quarter two figures were, were done, and reviewed, we've working, been working on the budget, um, and the quarter three review is now underway, and there will be a revised forecast forming part of the um, papers, the budget paper for the February combined authority meeting. The capital spend position, we're at about 30% of spend at quarter two. Um, this is, it is always thus. Um, the spend tends to start slower and ramps up towards the end of the year. That's partly because we don't do um, accruals during the year, so we, we do this on the basis of what has been paid to partners and um, externally. At the year end, we do make an adjustment for the work that has been completed but not yet paid out. So the spend does tend to ramp up at the end of the year as it, as it does for um, other authorities, but it is worth noting there's still quite a way to go. But there are a lot of schemes out there. There's a lot of things that are happening um, in delivery stage, having got through the earlier stages. Um, the report is just for noting at this stage, so there will be more information in the budget paper in due course and the quarter three at the next <coughs> meeting. But if there are any questions or observations, happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Any risk factors in this quarter, Angela? There's none that have emerged from the quarter two. We're obviously aware um, there, are, there are risks that we have been considering through the budget preparation, um, that there's always external factors that, that can come in. Um, so we are, we are watching, monitoring, and there is always pressure on um, bus tendered services and concessionary travel, for example, um, which we say we'll go into more detail in the budget papers. Um, at the moment, they're not reporting overspend, but there is still, there is still or, or pressures to um, manage within budget, but there is still, there's still some months of the year to go, so we continue to monitor. We will never be risk-free, but we, we do what we can to monitor. Um, and, and re-forecast where needed. Thank you. I know it's a busy time of year for your team. Uh, any questions? Jocelyn. Uh, yes, just on the uh, uh, full year forecast outturn, um, I notice an expenditure, consultancy and professional services and indirect employee costs are both predicted to be quite significantly overspent. Um, why is that? Is that related to projects or is that overhead or a, a good observation um, you're absolutely right they are with there are a number of um, revenue funded projects that, that flow through this budget so 
we have a line for the um, for some of the the employee costs, some of the consultancy costs, some of the non project we, so the line non staffing project costs. They will be matched out by income on the other side. So if there are timing differences, we will reconcile all those at year end and ensure that they balance out. So they're not um, they're not creating an additional pressure on the revenue budget. Is there enough clarity on that line that we understand what exactly it refers to? Given there has been a question, I think it would be helpful. We, we have put in the in the draft budget page, we have put a bit, little bit of a glossary. I think we should probably expand on that. And we are looking during next year, we have our new finance system now live. We are now looking at how we use that to generate better reporting, better information. Um, and I think some of these headings here are are ones that we have used in the past as we move to become a more diverse mayoral command authority i think we probably need to look at how we present this um, and it might be an interesting one to bring some options back to a few meeting of the level of detail the sorts of headings that we'd like to see so we can make sure the information is is at a level that, that works for you in your decision making Thank you, and as always, we move, try as much as possible to move away from things that would suggest we're not being as transparent as possible. And opaque often looks like you've got something to hide, so to make these papers as accessible as possible, I, as mayor, have got, gone from never looking at budgets like this two and a half years ago to scrutinising them. So I will always say and make the case for um, colleagues across the organisation, particularly chairs of scrutiny committee and so on, that we show as much detail as is necessary and needed for people to understand exactly what we're doing, what the position is. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, ben. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think one, one pressure that I'm not sure will have come through in the quarter two, but certainly there in quarter three has been um, ICT pressures. We've had a number of cyber attacks and there's a, there is quite a a program um, to kind of um, robustly defend against those kind of things. So I think we're finding that is quite a significant pressure both now and going forwards. And the other thing that won't be in these figures, but we need to be mindful of, is the situation of Bedford Interchange, mm -hmm. um, uh, about which we'll, we'll be bringing more to uh, the command authority in, uh, in February and March. Thank you. And as we saw with our friends at British Library, that a cyber attack is absolutely devastating for your budget and for your reserves and so on. So I think that work is really important that we protect ourselves. But as you say, um, there could potentially be other financial pressures depending on the interchange and the outcomes there. Thank you. Any further comments? No, no, lovely. So we are happy to note the information. Thank you. So moving on to item six, business planning and budget. This provides an update on the current state of business budget planning, 24-25, building on the position considered by the CA in December. And Angela, if you could talk us through this again. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you say, this is a, a bit of a position statement um, whilst we're going through the, the detailed work on the budget. Um, in terms of business planning, because the budget starts with a business plan, um, we have got multi-year outcomes, which are attached as Appendix 1. These are um, drawn from the West Yorkshire Plan, the corporate priorities, um, and underpinning all of, um, flowing from all of these will be the detailed activities. We will be bringing those to the budget meeting in the form of plans on a page that will give a, um, a summary of the, the key actions and activities and beneath those will be detailed business plans for each team with, with clear accountabilities for each activity um, that we'll be publishing in due course also. Um, the, the corporate plan is will also be finalised following on from the plans on the page and the business plans that are approved in February, and um, that will come forward in March. And we're very much trying to focus on a multi-year business plan and a multi-year budget um, and that will be work ongoing throughout the coming year. Um, so we move away from the cycle of the once a year budget and, and business plan that we are looking across, um, ideally a four year term, um, and we'll be developing that over the coming months. The, so the outcomes, the multi-year outcomes are attached as appendix one, and there's some narrative in the paper that, um, that highlights all the key themes in those. 
the 24-25 budget continues. Um, we, it, we took a paper to the Command Authority in December where um, there was confirmation that there is, there is no capacity for an increase in the transport levy, so we've been seeking to, to balance the transport pressures without recourse to a, a transport levy increase. Um, and we'll be setting out that in more detail in the budget paper. We took the general reserve strategy and treasury management position to the Governance and Audit Committee last week and had some useful feedback from the members of that meeting. Thank you. Um, and all of this will come together in the budget paper for the 1st of February. Thank you. Thank you. And can I say, um, I'm really pleased to see the draft multi-year outcomes because becoming more outcome focused I think is the direction of travel that we want to send the CA in, that it's the, what we are delivering and the impact we have on people's lives that is going to be our priority. Any comments on this paper? Not as yet, thank you. Okay, so to note for information, thank you. So moving on to item seven, workforce development and publication of pay gap reports. Um, the report is to share with committee information regarding our our workforce, the actions taken, and progress made with regards to changing our workforce profile from that uh, equality, diversity, and inclusivity perspective, and also to share the gender and ethnicity pay gap reports. Um, also, just to note, and I'm really pleased to be able to say that we have applied to be a Living Wage Foundation accredited employer, uh, but also this is incredibly important to me that as the only woman Metro Mayor in the country, <coughs> being able to be um, a, a lead uh, CA when it comes to uh, our pay gaps, whether that's gender or ethnicity, is absolutely a priority. Uh, we need to uh, do our own levelling up in our own organisation. And I think some of the initiatives that we have uh, set underway in the last couple of years, hopefully, are starting to turn the tanker um, to give us those better outcomes. But over to you, Joanne. Thank you, May. Um, thank you for that introduction to the paper. So you'll note from the paper that, as the Mayor says, the purpose of this report is to provide an update to the committee on a number of workforce issues, um, to give a, an update on the progression that we've made with changing the workforce profile um, as the and the information shared in the to, to management information provides a lot more detail in terms of the breakdown of that workforce profile and the progress that's been made in a number of areas. Um, and to share with you the gender and the ethnicity pay gap reports, which following um, them being shared with you at this committee meeting will go forward to be published on the Combined Authorities website and on the government portal with regards to the, the gender pay gap. So the information shared in the report talks through the staff profile, the EDI measures, and where the recruitment activity that we have been undertaking is showing some signs of positive progress um, across the range of protected characteristics. So the people that are joining us tend to be more diverse, they tend to be younger, and they tend to be more willing to share with us the protected characteristics that they have, which is really important in us being able to consider that report on that and to address where we still have gaps in, the, in our workforce profile. Um, in terms of the pay gap reports, there is evidence that they are closing, but the rate of that isn't as fast as we would like. Um, and so we are doubling our efforts in terms of the actions that we're taking to address those pay gaps in a number of areas. The information also shows that the um, gives more detail in terms of what those steps are so it shares with you information about the activity that we're taking in relation to recruitment and retention um, where we're looking at workforce planning so the uh, ethnicity pay gap gives more detail of the levels of roles across the organization and where that gender profile is spread um, we're looking at how we can impact on the, the profile as we look to recruit more specialist and technical skills as we start to scale up some of the major programs that are coming forward. Um, we're looking at a lot of learning and development activity, so there's particular programs that are detailed in there where we are looking to take positive action, again, to address some of those gaps in the workforce profile and to make sure that once we are bringing in a more diverse 
um, staff group were then able to development through the organisation and we can show some progress in terms of their career development uh, because the data, as you see, is showing that we have particular gaps at a senior level and um, even more so when you break that down in terms of women at a senior level. And so we're looking at where we can put in place specific development programmes to address what the data is telling us. And then there are a number of charters and accreditations that we have signed up for and there are action plans that have been developed in order to address the criteria, look at the gaps that we may have and again put programmes in place to uh, do the work to make sure that we are fully compliant with those. Um, the more detailed data of the pay gaps is in the uh, pay gap reports um, but happy to take any questions on, on anything that's in the paper. Thank you. If you could just uh, reflect the um, internal promotions, because this is important for us, that in order to get more diverse uh, leaders, we need to really enable our current workforce to go through the ranks to, to the top. Could you speak to that, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the data shows that we are fairly evenly spread when we look at internal recruitment and external recruitment. Um, which brings advantages, obviously, um, because that's showing that people are progressing within the, within the organisation. They are finding career development routes and they are um, looking at the combined authority as a place to come and work and stay and progress their career. Um, but the downside of that is that impacts on external recruitment and being able to kind of refresh that workforce profile and be able to um, focus effort and attention on where those specific gaps are. But the fact that we are bringing in more people across that diverse range of protected characteristics then gives an, gives an excellent cohort in terms of that internal development and progression. And some of the work that we're doing linked into the recent HR system that's gone live is around talent management, succession planning, and being able to have the tools to identify where that talent is um, develop that talent, be really clear about the career progression ladders, um, take positive action in addressing that and making sure that we can really develop people whilst they're here. Um, and so that internal progression route uh, to promotion opportunities is there for them. Thank you. And certainly the workforce uh, since COVID, we've got greater stability, haven't we? And it is pleasing to see that our sickness levels are lower than national average. We do, yes. So retention rates are, are high. Um, the feedback that we get is that people are feeling more that this is a good place to work. Um, they're telling other people that what a great place to work it is and our attraction levels for the roles that we are advertising is higher. Thank you. Any comments on this paper? Yes, Susan. So I was going to remark, as you say, Mayor, that the sickness levels are low and that is a you know, testament to how motivated and how how healthy you keep people here as well, so that's that's good. Um, just on the diverse recruitment, um, do you now therefore make sure you have diverse panels for every job that's recruited? Uh, that, just to make sure I'm thinking. Um, we do make that a requirement of the recruitment panels, and we are rolling out lots of briefings for recruiting managers in terms of um, how to recruit well, how to recruit in accordance with the Combined Authority uh, Recruitment Toolkit and how to ensure that any um, bias, unconscious bias or otherwise, is taken out of that decision-making process. So we do have a requirement that, that panels are balanced. They're not always, um, and it is something that we need to continue to address because obviously we're, we're, the recruiting managers come from the pool of recruitment uh, of manager levels that we know is not diverse. So it is something that we do need to continue to work on. Yeah, if we just from a senior management point of view can just make sure that message goes out that you know that that policy does need to be enforced and it is very <coughs> taken very seriously I think that'd be very helpful absolutely and that's where when we have um, uh, recruitment particularly at senior levels I think our colleague panels have been invaluable and we might have taken a view about a candidate um, and then a colleague panel be like I absolutely couldn't work with that person because of such and such and it's very illuminating and I would say I always ask when I can the reception staff how were they when they came in and it's very eye-opening that people can be as sweet as a knot in an interview and they were quite rude to the staff 
And it's taking the whole picture, isn't it, of somebody when they're being recruited. So, Jocelyn. I just wanted to ask if uh, external people are ever brought in to bolster panels when you're short of representation. Thank you. Yes, we, we use external people in, in a couple of ways. So we have um, specialists in a particular field who can come and advise a recruitment panel or where we're working in partnership. Um, so on a, a programme where we've got partners involved, we will ask partners to come and be part of that recruitment process as well. So we, we do use external people in the, in the process. Yeah, I just think it's really important to emphasise that when you're in a period of rapid growth and you're doing an awful lot of recruitment, and you need to, it's very important that these principles aren't neglected and that you keep them at the forefront of your mind. Thank you. And certainly that suggestion about external support to absolutely make sure that no interview goes ahead without that diversity is something that we can maybe take away and have a look at how we could achieve that and how costly potentially that could be. But as a priority, uh, to Jocelyn's point, that we are going to be seeing rapid growth, particularly in transport around mass transit. So we can't let speed uh, be the enemy of our ambitions. Um, ben, you wanted to come in? Thank you. Mayor, yeah, thank you. And, and I, I definitely echo and agree with, with, those, with those points. Um, two, I want to make two, two quick points. One was that um, on, on practically every senior appointment, we will always have one of our partner authorities around the table as well and, uh, and and often that's a way in which we also use to kind of increase the diversity um, both of the kind of the individual but also of the perspective um, for, for, for the roles um, the second is I think we I think we're at quite an interesting time now in terms of how embedded that belief in having uh, diversity in panels is through the organization mm -hmm. because we we're, we're shifting to our new um, HR payroll system see anywhere and that's more self-service so it'll be interesting to see and more emphasis on the manager to ensure that their panels are are diverse so that there's we, we will need to do quite a bit i think of internal communications to ensure that those messages are are are, are landed uh, because there won't always be the the, the hr uh, people there to enforce that so so we need it'll be a good test of whether it's whether edi is truly embedded through the organization so, uh, good chat, thank you. Um, also, just to reflect on the fact about the gender pay gap, Mary Paley Marshall was in the 1800s, an academic who, and an economist who went to Ox uh, Cambridge, then became a professor there. And she coined the phrase, <laughs> gender pay gap. So we have a, a long um, history of this and it's not going to be solved in, you know, in the next five years, but, we as an organization have to be a trailblazer in this space. So um, thank you for the work that you do. And I know certainly bringing in the new HR um, uh, IT program has been incredibly challenging for HR team. So thank you for your determination to, to also share that learning across the organization. So thank you. Further thoughts? No, thank you. So let's move on to my most exciting topic on this agenda, which is level four devolution to Sarah. Thank you, Mayor. So um, obviously the paper here is um, the first paper that's kind of outlining um, the, um, the level four devolution framework, uh, which is obviously marking a move towards that greater devolved funding and powers to kind of eligible institutions who choose to participate. Um, I think it's important to say that uh, we've got great ambitions in West Yorkshire and whilst um, it doesn't fully meet our ambitions in terms of moving towards a single settlement, this is a really great um, stepping stone for us and is, is, is welcomed. Um, the paper sets out um, kind of the content of the, the level four framework and it, it, it kind of highlights some particular um, good examples of the things that are going to be of benefit to us um, moving forward if we choose to take up this offer. Um, and particularly there uh, around funding simplification um, with consolidated pots for, for the, the department leveling up housing and communities funding and also integrated transport funding. The, those consolidated pots I think are are one of the, the, the great things that will give us some um, um, additional uh, flexibility uh, moving forward. Um, I think the paper highlights um, that you'll see there some other kind of um, key areas around um, adult skills um, and affordable homes and net zero, um, and also around that new concurrent power um, in, in respect of public health duty. Um, in addition, the framework also gives us um, um, some other opportunities around um, the move to a general rather than a functional power of competence. Um, and, and because because this is now standardising devolution across across the country, 
Um, we're, we're also being given the opportunity to apply for powers that other areas have, have previously been given. Um, and, and also um, to look at any potential areas where we might want some technical adjust adjustments to historic um, kind of legislation. So an example that's in there is um, the current um, um, legislative requirements around the location of roundabouts and getting approval for roundabouts, which um, currently sits with the Secretary of State. So again, we've, we've just potentially got that opportunity to kind of look at some probably um, um, activity that's taken place in the past that would limit our ability to kind of move forward. Um, so also outlined in the paper is the application process um, in terms of the timeline and readiness conditions that we'll need to meet. Um, one of the key aspects of that is areas confirming that they will sign up to the and, and implement the new scrutiny protocol, uh, which is quite important. And you'll see in there that uh, one of the proposals around scrutiny is to, to kind of look at future working and rela relationships, potentially kind of moving towards a single scrutiny committee. Um, and also there around how we might engage with MPs further um, in, in kind of arrangements. Um, and we eligible institutions will need to decide which parts of the framework they, they want to choose. It's up to them to decide what they want to take forward. Uh, but if we want to do so, uh, we need to submit a formal letter by the 31st of January 2024 if we want to kind of access um, these powers speedily um, before the, the next general election. The paper sets out um, kind of the work that we've been doing in West Yorkshire. We've been working quite closely uh, with our colleagues in, in councils um, to kind of better understand the opportunities that are on offer. Um, and essentially where we are now is um, it kind of in a position where I think we've got agreement or we, we've, we've been talking to our partners about how we might submit that letter to by that deadline date. Uh, so FRCC today have been asked to consider the, the framework and the policy information um, and to kind of um, enter into that further discussion with government by through that submission of the letter. Um, I think um, what is important to know is this does signal that intent to engage with government um, and there's a lot of work to do following on from the framework. We are not signing up to anything specifically at that stage. Each of the individual powers that are um, set out in the framework will need to kind of have that conversation with government um, as we move forward. Um, so that's kind of really important, I think, to, to know as part of the paper. Um, I think what's also important to know is that obviously this is the next step in devolution for us and that's going to signal you know, greater collaboration with our, our partners. Uh, really important that we continue to work well together uh, but timely I think that we've uh, taken this opportunity to review our principles and the ways in which we work collectively together. That's going to be an ongoing piece of work that's going to be really important over this coming period to make sure that we kind of maximise the benefits and that we're, that we're kind of working really well um, together over this coming period. So next steps are set out in the paper there. Um, um, obviously, um, um, getting um, approval to submit the letter is pretty key, uh, but we will be um, doing further detail work on the scrutiny protocol. Um, um, corporate scrutiny are meeting tomorrow to consider um, this work, and there'll be a working group of colleagues looking at, at things moving forward. Um, and then obviously we'll be coming back to the CA on the 1st of February, um, and then we'll be kind of working collectively together over the coming period. I'll stop talking. Thank you so much, Sarah. And can I say thank you to the team who had to work over Christmas uh, to get this letter into shape and also to our leaders around the table because this has been a collective effort um, to get this letter together at such speed um, to ensure that West Yorkshire is at the table when further devolution is being discussed. This isn't what we want. We want a trailblazer deal that Greater Manchester and West Midlands have. We want that single settlement, that single funding pot with all the flexibilities of it. But I feel this is a bridge, given that we were negotiating with a government that potentially were completely disinterested. Um, I think the fact that we've got it over the line is all credit to our teams and to the political pressure that we exerted. Because this isn't only for us, this is of course for other MCAs and new mayors coming down the track, that they will be able to uh, uh, pull down from this framework what they feel that their region needs. So thank you again, uh, Sarah. You're new to the organisation, you really did have to hit the ground running. So thank you. Um, Jane. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, perhaps if I could um, just uh, express a tiny bit of disappointment, which is that there isn't a large amount of money that comes from central government with yeah. this, but there are some prizes, really, and I absolutely endorse this paper. I think the prize is not about the standardisation of what the government are offering, but it's actually about what you mentioned in your introduction, which is the flexibility, the flexibility of spending money in the way that's right for West Yorkshire, for our place, really. Um, and I very much welcome the work that's in here, which is about the partnership, because in some ways it sets out the way in which we have actually tried to be, trying to work together 
in partnership. So I think it expresses what we've already been doing and, and builds builds on that. I think it also sends a message to government in terms of uh, being serious. And you mentioned um, Greater Manchester and the West Midlands. Actually, this is West Yorkshire. We can be more ambitious than that. Indeed. And in some ways, it's laying down a market, saying to government, you know, the prize is actually, this is us, this is West Yorkshire in the north. These are the things, these are the sites that we've set our eyes upon and we really want to do well. Give us these powers. We will use them wisely and we will use them ambitiously for the people of West Yorkshire. So strongly, strongly endorse this report. Thank you so much, Jane. And certainly the fact that um, sometimes people say, well, you're a new MCA, you've got to wait your turn. Actually, as a combined authority with the growth deal, we spent on time and on budget, as Councillor Lewis often reminds me, a um, uh, billion pounds. We know how to do this. Uh, we have um, unlimited ambition for our region. And this is an amazing opportunity for any iteration of government to see growth. You invest in mayors, you give us the power and the money, we can provide growth for the rest of the country. So um, thank you for your support. Um, Susan, did, James, did you have your hand up? Yes. Oh, right. sorry, um, Susan, then James. And so no, um, so equally welcome this uh, next step in devolution. I've always been a big fan of devolution to West Yorkshire and I'm very you know, delighted we have it because without that, we wouldn't be able to deliver a lot of our growth ambition. So all across West Yorkshire, we see that happening and that's, you know, really encouraging to see but we could do a lot more as you say Mayor. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, say that obviously the all the documents here are sort of like a, a menu from government aren't they really so it's not necessarily the deal, deal that we'll come up with but this is what is on the table so we will be in negotiation now is my understanding uh, to make sure we get the deal that's right for us so some of these things we will fine tune and change as we go forward to make sure it fits West Yorkshire I just wanted to you to make that point really if that's okay thank you and it isn't one size fits all each region has its own um, strengths and this is just to move to the next phase where we're saying yes we want level four devolution and then of course the conversations happen uh, James thank you mayor just to follow on from um, Jane and Susan yeah, I um, feel I've been involved in devote uh, into my second decade now of <laughs> Um, West Yorkshire uh, devolution um, um, negotiations and I think the important point and fully agree with the recommendations here is about the need um, um, the need to move um, forward I think sometimes we can, we can all be a bit frustrated um, about the slow pace we know we can deliver when we're given devol devolution and we know um, we're ambitious um, as a combined authority as councils and of um, businesses and residents in West Yorkshire for us to do a lot more but the um, this is the right step to take um, now. We always will push for more, push for what's right for West Yorkshire, but we do need to uh, move forward. Thank you. And uh, as you know, with the famous musical uh, Hamilton, you've got to be in the room where it happens, and we've got to be in the Devo room. Uh, we've got to be in that space. Um, Cathy, I wonder, any comments? Yes, uh, thank you. We welcome this, uh, and I think it is uh, a way of pushing forward. It's a partnership approach, and I, I just think that we we are serious, and we have to take us serious. The work that we are doing, and uh, Councillor Scullion did say that there's not a lot of money that comes with us, but we are able to take on the challenge, so that's good news. Good stuff. Any further comments? No? Thank you. So, uh, we're asked to note the recent publication of the government's level four Devo framework, which sets out guidance, the powers and flexibilities on offer. Also to note that um, work has been taken place across the partnership to consider the opportunities presented through level four and uh, uh, undertaken to develop our response, agreed to submit a letter of application to the government by the deadline of the 31st of January, and to note that the initial submission of letter of application to the Secretary of State does not constitute an irrevocable step and does not form part of the statutory process as outlined paragraph 2.13. All happy to note? Super, thank you. Great stuff. Well, that brings us to the end of the meeting. That was pretty swift. Um, thank you all so much for attending, and I look forward to our next meeting. When is the next one, Ben? The next one is 6th of February, coming pretty soon down the track. Thank you.